you're about to listen to Workplace Worldwide, a podcast featuring news, deep dives and interviews about our workplaces and workers' rights worldwide. Another one. Welcome to Workplace Worldwide, and we have part two of our interview with Kimberly Nguyen coming up on today's episode. So I'm not wasting any time, and I strongly suggest you don't either. What I mean by that is if you haven't listened to part one of this interview, you're missing out. Us introducing Kimberly, you're missing out on a lot of context for part two. So go back and do that now. But assuming that you have done that and that you are just desperate to hear part two, here it is. Let's go. No one really knows why this ad ended up being posted on LinkedIn. Yeah. So no one knows why this ad was posted on LinkedIn. Never really got a clear answer on that. Uh, my manager speculated that maybe they were, you know, getting ready to convert some people. So I waited around to see if, like, maybe the next person in line was getting converted. I'm I, fair enough that, you know, they wouldn't consider me over someone who's, like, next in line has been there for, like, two years. Mm. Um, but I didn't hear any news of anyone being converted. So I'm not really sure what happened with that listing. Um, yeah, it's it's a mystery to all of us. Okay. So no one knows why it happened and then nothing really happened thereafter. Uh, yep, that's, um, that's essentially how things work usually. So you, this was how you brought it up with your team at Citibank, which was the people who were actually posting it, but you were the agency employee. Were there any other follow-ups or reactions or anything like that from your tweet after you sort of went public about it? Well, no, you didn't go public. You posted your frustrations and then that went public. <laughs> I started getting a bunch of like phone calls from the agency and I think they were trying to fire me, but I, at the time, conveniently was on PTO. So I ignored their calls. Um, they straight up at some point called me like once every hour, starting at like 7 a.m. Pacific time. Um, and then they like left me voicemails and they texted me. They like messaged me on every like work channel they possibly could. Like they're straight up harassing me. And I was like, well, I'm on PTO, whatever this is, can wait until I'm back in the office on Monday. So I just didn't respond. Um, but I called my boss um, at City, my manager at City, and I said, you know, I'm getting a lot of phone calls from the agency. There is probably a high likelihood that I might be let go. Mm. And so I want to make sure that, you know, if I don't come in Monday or am not allowed to come in Monday that I can, I transition my projects to the appropriate people. Um, don't leave anybody like dangling. Mm -hmm. Um, I recognize my, my fault in this. Like I take responsibility for what I said in my tweet. I don't regret that I said it. I might regret some of the the repercussions, but if, if, if this leads to me being let go, I understand. And my manager said, actually, you know, I've been on the phone with our lawyers all day and I don't think that we can, we're going to let you go. Like we fully expect you to be back in the office Monday. And I said, Oh, really? And he said, yeah, well, it's your legal right to, to complain about your salary. So you know, we're not going to retaliate. And so, um, I never followed up with my agency who had been like, so desperately trying to reach me. And eventually they stopped trying to reach me and I've been an employee ever since. So, um, I guess everything turned out fine. That's interesting. Did did they use the word retaliate? <laughs> they did use the word retaliate. Yeah, they said we will not retaliate, and I was like, okay, very uh, very legal. Um, I mean, and and at no point are they actually addressing the concerns that you raised in the tweet. They're just being like, no, no, we won't retaliate. That's it. They addressed it with the media, the city bank specifically. Yeah, so, but never with you. No, no. I mean, I'm not going to ask how that makes you feel. I think that's pretty obvious, but like, what's your game plan? <laughs> like, do you just like kind of, because I mean, like you said, it's sort of turned out well, but I mean, are they, the ball's in their court, they're just never going to kick it, I guess, is how it's going to be at your employment. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's like really difficult to have a game plan because I feel like my experience of trying to, negotiate for my market value has been um like the meme where all the spider-mans are pointing at each other you know yeah 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 because like they keep telling me to go back to my agency and my agency is like no you got to do a performance review and then like I think at some point the associated press like actually asked city they're like well can't you just give the agency more money to give her money and then he said 
well, actually, she's not qualified for that salary ban. They told the Associated Press that. They told a bunch of media outlets that she's not qualified for that salary ban. And I was like, well, that's odd because one of my coworkers who I, I spoke to arguably has like more specific experience to this role than me um, is actually getting paid less than me. So like, is he qualified for that amount that like, I don't like, I don't understand where the I'm unqual unqualified came from, but they, they kind of cited the specific like five to eight years in, in the job description. Um, and to be real, like I'm not that far off from the five to eight years of experience. Mm. And I also just feel like that's boilerplate text that they copied and pasted from human resources. Like, I don't think they're actually holding anybody to five to eight years of experience. So they just really like needed a reason mm -hmm. to, to be able to justify to the media why they weren't going to attempt to to pay me more money. So no, I don't have a game plan. I'm honestly, I'm honestly tired of playing the game. I don't want to play the game. I just want to show up to work and mm. do a good job and then go home. Like I don't, I don't want to play this game. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that's kind of what it feels like though, as well, you know, because like you say, there's this um, proxy communication. So they'll tell the media, you know, X, Y, and Z, but they won't communicate that with you. I mean, what, what can a rational, reasonable employee do when their own, um, you know, when the people involved, the employers, the people involved in the transaction at least are not willing to address them directly, you know, it's, yeah, not great. Right. Maybe just to go a little bit um, more into the, this, the side of it where we talk a, a bit more about pay equity in general. I think what we're seeing now, and especially in the States, you know, the strikes are on the rise. That's also happening in the UK and in Europe. There is clear worker dissatisfaction and dare I say distress. It's getting to a point of deep distress for, for many, many people. And I think we sort of had this post-pandemic period where there felt like there was a bit of optimism about how we could negotiate with our working lives, be, be that cold hard cash or the other benefits that come with that. However, it feels as though the pendulum for the corporate world has completely swung in the other direction. They're really sort of doubling down on this idea that actually, like, you have equity. <laughs> Don't, didn't you see the D&I e &I policy? Like, you have it. <laughs> and kind of like just moving away from it. So why do you think it's such a struggle for these companies and for this corporate culture to embrace the realities of equitable workplaces? I think that it is harder for them to kind of enact these policies that may cause any like short term loss of profits because of the way that we set up shareholders and like, because it used to be the case. Um, there's actually a really, really good New York Times article on this about this company that actually ended up like outsourcing all of their labor to like other countries even though like it was pretty clear from the outset that that wasn't going to be good for the longevity of the company. Um, when they did outsource their labor, like the, the quality of their manufactured parts kind of went down. They had to like train all of these people. It was like really costly to train them, but just because like in the short term, like paying these like foreign workers, a lower wage was going to cause like a bump in profits. It like pleased all of their shareholders that really just, they just wanted their dividends. They wanted the, the value of their stock to increase. That's really all that they cared about. And I think the New York Times did a really good job delving into why this wasn't an issue in the past. And part of the reason why it wasn't an issue in the past is because in the past at this company, the majority of the shareholders were workers. As part of their compensation package, they got they got a share of the, the, the st they got stocks, and then they were able to have a, like more of a say um, and more power into the decisions that are made at the company and to be able to advocate for themselves as like actual shareholders in the company. So I think that like there are like workers are no longer like getting their slice of the pie anymore. Like they don't have any power anymore. Like the power sits completely in the hands of the company and not, not even really the company, typically just the shareholders and the shareholders only care about one thing. So I think that like, that's, that's why, um, you know, a lot of companies are really kind of like swinging their, their pendulum to the other side because like coming out of the pandemic, now all of these people who maybe like lost money during the pandemic, um, they're coming out and they're like, well, pandemic is over. Like we want our returns. Like we want our money. Um, and so it's just kind of a bad situation for, for workers who are kind of caught in that, that game. 
I would agree. And there's been some interesting statistics. We've had so many layoffs in 2023 from really big companies. And every time there's a mass layoff, you see the, the social world reacting, you know, with, with sort of a conscience about it all. And then you see the share value get a bump. The market likes it when companies lay off employees en masse because they're going to get that little profit bump because they're cutting costs. The whole system is incentivizing C-level leaders and and shareholder and everyone that's working for the shareholders ultimately um, to kind of disregard workers. And I think when you combine it with their performance sort of, you know, there's also become like a very performative track with like a lot of big companies, which is we are this, we are already this, it's sort of rammed down our throat. We sponsor pride now. And then you kind of have this very secret, almost like, I don't know what you're, you're the poet, but like, what's the word, like an overlord, which is the shareholders that, you know, they're just going to do anything to, to please because that's how they get their money back. How do you think this plays out in the shorter term? sort of 2023 to 2024, but also into 2025 and beyond? I mean, I think obviously this is a very like unsustainable practice. Like there's kind of this idea that, you know, the rich are just getting richer and the poor are just getting poorer. But then like, let's just take that to its logical conclusion, right? The rich only get richer, the poor only get poorer. Eventually, like, all the poor people, if we just keep, like, going down this road, are just going to die. Like, we will no longer have, like, a poor class. And then, like, it'll just be the rich people who are going to be, like, arguing over, like, who's the next, like, level of poor. So, like, it's it's unsustainable for, for, for the long term. Um, and also, like, it's a drain on, like, resources. Like, if we think of, like, even in the fashion industry, fast fashion, although it's, like, creating a bunch of, like, value and a lot of money for, for all these people, it's unsustainable yes. eventually like, we are going to run out of space or out of landfills to like, dump our clothing in. Um, we're going to run out of raw materials to like keep producing this clothing so i just think that it's very very short-sighted um to to do business this way yes and it seems to be a running theme given that we sort of started more acutely talking about your experiences and sort of having that that exact same sentiment and then going to the more macro level and sort of seeing the same problem, this shorter term thinking, making these decisions um, to, to get the profit and then moving on. It's, it's not an old concept, but I feel that the with social media and just like general capacity with technology, we have just been able to sort of put that into hyper overdrive and sort of shorten the, the lifespan of the capitalist beast, so to say. But it does appear that that workers are kind of getting to that point where the only leverage we now have as workers or that workers have is time. And now we're starting to see company after company after company face strikes because people are saying, we are not going to give you that time to make a point of how valuable that time is. Uh, however, we're also now seeing the de people being de-incentivized to strike because of the sheer amount of union busting going on. Uh, is this something that you, given all of these things, not just specifically union busting, but is this factoring into how you think about your work opportunities and what's next for you in terms of your day job? Um, if I'm being honest, yes and no. Like, I don't think about it like a lot just because like I've never worked in a place where there was a union. I've never mm. been part of a union right um typically unions are not for white collar workers um it would be nice i think if i had a union um i think about that a lot i'm like wow like it would be great um if all of the contractors could get together and somehow like form a union to like you know yes. make some demands to, to just demand basic things like livable salaries and like pay time off things mm -hmm. like that um, but the reality is, I think that there's going to be very few places that I, you know, if I were to look for a new job right now, there's going to be a few places that are going to have like a union like that or a union to protect me. Um, so part of what I'm trying to also think about is what, what can you do like outside of a union? Like union is a bad word to, yeah. to like the corporate 
like overlords, as, as you put it. So like, how can we reframe the concept of unionizing so that it is not such a bad word and could possibly be seen as like a positive thing to the company? What do you think would make unions not be a bad word? What do you think that there needs to be? Is it to do with media? And I have some questions about the media as well, but is it related to, to the media and the way they talk about corporate culture or just society? I'm not honestly really sure because at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is you're trying to take the concept of a union which is like a bad word to the corporate overlords. And you're trying to have a union, but not call it a union. So I think that's like where, you know, these understandings of these like macro level, like things would probably come into play because the only way that I think that corporations really respond is for financial gain. Like they're not going to do things because it's the right thing. Let's be realistic. Um, they only want to do things when it either causes an increase in profit or to mitigate a, a loss of profit. Yes. And so if people can organize and find ways to affect the bottom line, that is the only way that they're going to be able to to unionize or to like to make any sort of like impact. Um, and I think that's like the idea with the WGA strike right now is that like they're they're hoping to hold out until like the the film industry has had such like a bad time like you know mm-hmm. getting hit by you know their bottom line getting hit so um, we should all take notes from the WGA strike I'm, I'm really interested to see what the outcome is and if they're able to actually like renegotiate their their terms. I would agree, and I think what's what's fascinating about the WGA strikes and I guess. Also, I I suspect the SAG strikes are coming as well and potentially the Directors Guild is that it is, you know, if you take an employee like you, your work is not visible. Your day job isn't visible. We're taking, you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people whose jobs are very visible. And what we're seeing is nothing different to what we see in every single situation where you've got one group who wants to change the transaction and another group that wants to keep it as it is. And it seems to me that it's a huge learning opportunity. We had the WGA strikes in 2007, but like you said, like you've noted, this is something where we can really see with a lot of visibility, exactly how these negotiations take place and, you know, what's on the table and also the the degradation of people. They're not even asking for that much. That's what I find wild about this strike. (laughs) They're not even asking for that much. I also think that the things that they're asking for makes the industry better because like, I think there've been a lot of complaints in like recent years, like people have complained that like TV is unwatchable now. Um, All of these like streaming services are putting out like unwatchable content. People don't, they don't like the stuff that's being put out anymore. And in order to get better content, you need to pay the people who create the content because like promise you that the CEO of Netflix has zero ideas about like yeah. content. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the fact that they're just like, well, short term profits, we can actually continue to put out like really bad content. And actually we could put out more bad content by like maybe hiring AI to like replace writers instead. Um, and people will love that. Like I just, again, very short sighted. Um, mm-hmm. And people are gonna like, I canceled my Netflix subscription like yesterday. I was like, I, I'm not doing this anymore. Like this content, like I'm not watching this. I noticed this as well with myself with Netflix. A majority of the content I'm watching isn't written by someone and I wouldn't be that sad if I wasn't watching it. It's just because it's there and been reasonable. But now that transaction with myself is starting to change. I'm like, it's not worth it, bro, especially if you ain't going to pay people. Like, I'm not doing that. And and so I wanted to actually, just before we move too far on in the realm, is talk a little bit about the the media because I think – that's one thing that, that comes to my mind with the WGA strikes is how the media is covering it. And I'm very curious what you thought of the coverage of your tweet and the sort of aftermath of all of that in the media. Um, one of the first reporters who reached out to me literally said to me, she's like, well, we called your job for, con- for comment. And I was like, why would you do that? Like, these organizations are so chaotic. They're so large and chaotic that like I might've actually been able to fly under the radar and they might've not have known that I work there yeah. um, had these reporters not actually like reached out and, and talked to my job. 
Um, so I wasn't very happy about no. the fact that that happened. Um, That's not right. Right. And I wish they had asked. Um, I think their justification was like, well, you already tweeted so publicly anyway. And I was like, yeah, but I didn't name my company. Yeah. And you really underestimate how busy people are. Like, not that, like, there would be people who, who might see the tweet and might, like, clap for me, but never look up where I worked. Yeah, that's a, it's a bit of a violation as well. Because like you said, you know, you didn't put it, you, you tweeted something. It wasn't a public tweet for public consumption in the same way that they were sort of taking it as a reportable news story. Yeah, like, I didn't at Citibank. I didn't at my agency. No. You know, I was just like, I was like, this is just an experience that I had with an entity that I'm not going to name. Um, and I just want to like whine about it. And then like the media really took it and like ran with it. I think when I was like, some reporters later, they asked me, they're like, oh, is it okay if we name you or we name your company or we reach out to your company for, for comment? And I was like, honestly, the media train has left without me. So at this point, like it, <laughs> it doesn't matter um, whether you call or whether you don't call, whether you name me or don't, like I'm like, I'm already like the train's already left and I'm still at the station. Yeah. So, but I do appreciate that most media places, well, actually I didn't see any articles that were critical of what I did. No. And I, I was really looking like it was pretty reasonable. Like it was even the daily mail, like even the daily mail. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I appreciated the, the support. Um, and also once I knew, I was pretty strategic about it. Once I knew that like my job would be reached out to for comment, I actually said yes to nearly every reporter who called me and asked for comment or to ask for an interview because I realized that if they're going to find out about it anyway, I then needed to do everything in my power to actually blow it up as much as possible so that it would look extra and more bad if like my company did decide it was within their right to fire me mm -hmm. um and also like I think it was important that other people see my story too because like I think that everybody should be advocating for themselves at work everybody should be looking especially in jurisdictions where there are salary transparency uh laws everyone should be looking to see like what other companies are advertising you know the, the position for they should be looking to make sure that they're getting paid their market value um but yeah i um i don't have any complaints about the media in in this particular situation what i noticed through all the threads of reporting was this very common i think your case was so blatantly unjust and so blatantly unfair there was you know the the, the facts kind of stood on their own as sort of being like this is a genuinely just an unfair and unjust sort of situation and like you said I think it was also a, a great sense of relatability that maybe assisted with that virality I think so many people reading that I, I had clients uh, bring up the story with me you know here in Europe so it's one of those things where that that visibility on this kind of injustice is you know superficial as some people could write it off as just really um kind of needs to get out there even though you didn't plan to be I think you wrote the poet Lorette of pay transparency <laughs> was that yes yeah, yeah I, I named myself the the poet laureate of, of pay transparency um well because like I've always yeah I've always wanted to be like the poet laureate of something hopefully like I don't know the United States or like even like my own state the poet laureate of New York or something but um I'm not there yet. So I was like, okay, well, at least I can declare myself the poet laureate of gay transparency. Can we declare you that in our show notes um, and potentially an episode title? Uh, please do. <laughs> Let's make it spread. Because I don't think any other poet is working in this space. No, it's so niche. So like, I feel like I deserve this title. So yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you, yeah, you've you've earned it, and I think it's it's yours. And I'm definitely going to do everything I can to evangelize it. And thank you. Speaking of uh, being a poet, could you tell us a little bit more about like what your ambitions are and your hopes are with your poetry? Uh, I did just see you have some exciting news as well with the tour. So please tell us more about your work and what your ambitions are. Yeah, so I mean, currently I'm very focused on rounding out and finishing my year-long book tour. Um, so my book tour ends 
about in October. Um, I have been very blessed, I think, on this book tour. I was able to open the tour in my hometown of Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I brought my tour to Vietnam. Um, and I'm going to Spain cool. uh, in two weeks to guest lecture at a couple of universities. So in that regard, I'm, I'm so, so lucky because not that many poets get to first of all, tour, nor tour internationally. So um, mm -hmm. very, very grateful. Um, I also... Yeah. I think this isn't your day job, by the way. That's what I think people just should be aware. This is like, this is your real job, but it's not your day job and you're doing this well. Sorry to, inter to interrupt you, but I just wanted to say that. Yeah. Do you see these like bags under my eyes? Like clearly, like I don't sleep. Like <laughs> it's it's been rough, but um, it's it, it keeps me going, I think. Um Oh, and then also, like, I think to close out my tour, I will actually be closing in Slovakia. Oh, um, cool. Because I think one of my poems, yeah, my poems is going to be on display at their, their public museum. So I'm very, very excited about that. Yeah, but I think my ambitions as far as being a poet is to be able to, to do this full time. Yes. Um, to not have to kind of do it in between my day job to kind of be able to have like the mental energy to really like focus on it. Um, and it's not that I'm opposed to working full time either, because like I do need to get my health insurance from somewhere. Um, and truth be told, I, I do kind of like my job as a UX writer. Like it's it's kind of fun. It's like a different like mental exercise or gives me some like structure throughout the day. Um, but I don't have any like PTO, so I'm really like running on fumes here. Yeah. I, I'm um, <laughs> Yeah, so I am working on my next book because I uh, am always I'm always working on something. I always want to like keep writing. Mm -hmm. um, my friend is trying to bully me into writing a novel, which I'm finding that I'm not as good at um, as poetry. It's like a different skill set, but I'm I'm finding that it's um, embarrassing how bad you have to be at something before you <laughs> get really good at it. Yeah. So um, currently embarrassing myself in my drafts um, of my novel. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm just really hoping to, to be a writer for full time to maybe be the poet laureate of the United States someday. We are going to link to your shop as well, but I wanted to know if you could tell our listeners a little bit about your latest work, which is currently out here. I am burn me and just let them know a little bit about what this work is, because obviously buying directly from you is how people can support you the most. Yeah. Um, this book was a challenge for me because I decided that I was very ambitious and wanted to teach myself quantum physics to write this poetry collection. Um, wasn't very successful because quantum physics, it turns out, is very difficult. Um, but my the collection really kind of revolves around this idea of like quantum entanglement, which is essentially the fact that like the same particle can exist in like two states at the same time. Um, mm. And also kind of has theories about time and time kind of being an entanglement rather than a, a linear thing. So throughout the collection, I'm really just kind of like calling out through through space and time. And I think my, when my friends, when they initially read it, they said there's just kind of this like feeling of yearning. Um, and I think that's, that's really true because the, the, collection is a yearning to be like understood a yearning to like reach somebody a, a yearning to to connect with with someone anyone um so yeah without spoiling too much I think that's just like the overarching like themes of of the poetry collection and I really hope that they come out when people read, read it yeah, absolutely. I think I'm definitely going to uh, to get into it. I couldn't encourage people more uh, to get onto your shop and make sure that they, they buy this and hopefully get something from it. How else can our listeners uh, support you and how can they keep up with you in the digital world? Yeah, so I guess follow me on social media. Um, I'm K Win Poetry on Twitter and on Instagram, which are the two platforms that I'm most active on. I think that's that's really it because I don't like I don't have a Patreon. I I don't I don't have time to like yeah. curate a Patreon. I don't have time to like have like a, a medium blog like, or a paid Substack. Um, mm -hmm. But all of my tour dates are going to be announced on Instagram. Um, any like future books and, and writing that I that I have will be announced on Twitter and Instagram. So definitely keep up with me there. 
Perfect. And thank you so much for coming on and, and for telling us about your experiences and really, you know, the the thinking behind advocating for yourself in the workplace, but also as we discussed the repercussions, consequences and all of that in between. Thank you again for coming on. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Workplace Worldwide is produced by Kate Bailey and the team at Hand and Heart Media. For any inquiries related to this broadcast, please email hq at handandheart.eu. And don't forget to follow us on the gram at handandheart.eu. Original music is composed and performed by Amanda and produced by Amanda with Kyle Startup. You can follow Amanda and Kyle Startup on Instagram or listen to their music on Spotify, Apple or SoundCloud. If you love Amanda's music, we do too. And we ask you to please consider buying it directly from Bandcamp. Support indie always. Thanks for listening. We appreciate your support.